Hello again. This is Math 1120 coming to you from the College of DuPage. And the title of this lecture is Frictional and Drag Forces. As always, please be an active learner as you watch this video. Contact forces and friction. We've seen several problems in which an object rests or slides on a surface that exists that exerts forces on the object. Previously, we introduced the term normal force and friction force to describe these forces. Whenever two objects interact by direct contact, that is touching of their surfaces, we call the interaction of the forces contact forces. Normal and force Normal and friction forces are both contact forces. Friction is an important in many aspects of everyday life, and there are good things about it and bad things about it. For example, the oil in your car um, lubricates the moving parts and reduces the friction, but the friction between the tires and the road prevents slipping. Uh, similarly, air drag uh, decreases the car's fuel economy, but it does make parachutes possible. So friction is positive and negative. Uh, a frictionless surface that we've studied before is a useful concept in an ideal model uh, when the friction forces are small, but in the real world, it becomes uh, much more important. That's what we're talking about in this unit. So here we see a diagram, and so suppose you're trying to pull across a level surface a box, and the box has a weight, and there's a normal force component that goes, uh, goes up, and there's a frictional uh, force component because of the contact between the box and the surface that resists the motion here. So this frictional component of the force is going this way, uh, the normal components going up, and we really do have to think about the direction of these forces as well. So um, frictional and normal forces are really components of a single contact force. And you can see the friction goes this way, the normal force goes up, and so that ends up being the contact force. Now we have a formula for this and it really depends on the surface. So when the magnitude of the sliding friction force F sub K, and by the way, this is a kinetic friction force. That is, uh, this is the, uh, we're already in motion. So uh, while you're in motion, it's still, you have to do a force to keep it in motion. And so you're overcoming this kinetic friction force. Now this is proportional to the magnitude of the normal force. So the two are related by a constant, and this is mu sub k. And this is a constant, it's called the coefficient of kinetic friction. That depends on the surface that you're on, and we, I would give you this value in a problem, or sometimes you might be asked to find this value in a problem. So anyway, what we have is the kinetic frictional force is equal to the coefficient of friction mu sub k times the normal to the surface. And that normal to the surface is the normal force to the surface. And again, this is not showing you vectors. This is showing you magnitude. The units, because mu sub k is the ratio of two force magnitudes, you see it's uh, F sub k divided by the normal force. So it's newtons over newtons. So this is dimensionless. Uh, the friction force and the normal force are always perpendicular to each other. It is not a vector, but a relationship between the magnitudes of the two forces. A frictionless surface would correspond to the coefficient of kinetic friction would be equal to zero. And again, these are values that might be given in a problem, or you might be being asked to find this in a problem. Now, it turns out that there is not just the force of moving, but some of you might realize that it takes a little bit more to get something moving. And here you can see uh, what happens is that you're applying force, uh, but uh, what happens is that the, uh, the box is, uh, is at rest and doesn't really start moving until you apply a certain force to basically break it free, and then it moves. This coefficient of friction over here is called the um, static um, uh, friction. 
uh, to get it started uh, and the other one again is called the kinetic friction and so uh, the static friction actually is a larger value of this and we'll talk about uh, that as well so there's a difference between static friction and kinetic friction And so this is the relationship between the normal force and the maximum static friction force. When the maximum magnitude of the static friction force can be represented as proportional uh, to the magnitude of the normal force, the two are related by uh, this uh, constant, and the constant is called mu sub f. That's the coefficient of static friction, and that is less than or equal to the, uh, uh, the force uh, of, of static friction. In fact, that's the maximum value. And in fact, this is equal to uh, this um, uh, in, in most situations. And so that means this is the force that's required to get this moving. Again, it has no units. The static friction force is an adjustable force that always adjusts itself to keep the two surfaces from sliding against each other. The static friction force has a maximum possible value, which uh, is given by, as I said, the equality in the symbol. The ratio of the static friction is usually less than the corresponding coefficient. I should have said coefficient. The coefficient of static friction is usually uh, less than the corresponding uh, uh, coefficient of uh, uh, kinetic friction. If you think about that, that means that it takes a larger force for something to get started uh, for any two particular surfaces. Okay, so let's uh, do a calculation then. So uh, we're going to calculate the coefficients of static and kinetic friction, and we're going to be using Newton's second law. So suppose the delivery company has just unloaded a 500 Newton crate full of home exercise equipment in your driveway. You find that to get it started moving to your garage, you have to exert a horizontal force of 230 Newtons. Once the crate breaks three and starts to move, you can move at a constant velocity with only 200 newtons of force. It's easier once it breaks free. What are the coefficients of static and kinetic friction? Well, so what happens here is that the, uh, the forces in the uh, y direction must balance because you're not moving this in the y direction. You're only moving it in the x direction. So the normal plus the weight is equal to the normal minus 500 is equal to zero. So that means the normal component here is 500 newtons. But you are moving it in the x direction, so the tension that you're putting on this by uh, pulling on it plus the force of friction in the other direction is 230. So that is going to be 230. 230 minus the component of uh, uh, static uh, uh, friction that is opposing the motion is equal to zero. So F sub S is equal to 230. So the maximum is going to be when this is equal. So we say that this 230 newtons is equal to mu sub S times N. And I solve for mu sub S by dividing the two. And I find out that the coefficient of Um, static friction is uh, 0.46. Again, it is unitless. Now we perform a similar kind of calculation for the other one, but this time to move it in the uh, x direction, I only need 200 newtons. And this is now moving. And notice that I put kinetic because it's moving now. And so I can say that the uh, frictional force is equal to mu sub k times n. So the frictional kinetic force is equal to mu sub k times n. And so uh, what we can do is we can solve for mu sub k in this case. And we find that the mu, uh, kinetic friction, then the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0 0.4. So that follows along with what we talked about before. And you see we could calculate those in this example. Now let's... Um, do it in a more realistic case because you see you're not pulling it straight you're usually pulling this at an angle so here is what we're going to do we're doing the same problem uh, but we're pulling it at an angle and that angle is 30 degrees now remember that when we look at this then uh, you're pulling at this with t at 30 degrees uh, 
And so that means this has components. The component that's actually moving the box is t times cosine of 30. And um, this component here, where you're going at the angle, is part of it helps move the box. But the other part tries to lift the box. And so we have that. And we also have the force of friction that is pushing back this way. And by the way, this was, um, this was the coefficient of, um, of friction that we found. Um, uh, moving friction that we found on the previous problem. So this is 0.4 times n. So we have a number of forces. We have the one that's moving the box. We have the one that's resisting the moving of the box. And there's one that's going up that's resisting the weight. And that's at this angle, you're really sort of trying to lift the box. OK, so we will uh, look at the components in the uh, x direction and in the y direction. Now in the x direction what happens is you have the t cosine of 30 and then you uh, add to that the force of kinetic friction that's going the other way. So that's going to be t cosine 30 minus 0.4 n is equal to 0. Now notice that uh, n is a variable and t is a variable. So what happens here is we have one equation and two unknowns. But when we look in the y direction, this is the component that's trying to lift the box. So that is t times the sine of 30 um, plus the normal. Those are the ones that are going up. And then that uh, counteracts exactly the weight. And so that's going to be equal to 0. Again, I have t and n as unknowns in this equation. So you see I have two equations and two unknowns. You know how to solve these. These are two simultaneous equations and two unknowns, t and n. You learned how to solve this in your algebra, which is a prerequisite for the course. OK, so to solve them, you eliminate one unknown and solve for the other. We're doing this by substitution. And so uh, what we do is we look at the second equation. And we say that n is equal to 500 newtons minus t times sine 30. We substitute that back into the first equation. And now we only have one variable. And the one variable is t. We can solve this for t. And then we can back substitute in for n. So t ends up being 188 newtons. And n, the normal force, ends up being 406 newtons. Sometimes we also have um, resistance forces uh, that are happen when an object roofs through fluid. And this is a contact force as well because you have to exert a force to push the fluid out of the way. Now, it depends on what the fluid is. If the fluid, fluid is oil, it's one thing. If it's water, it's another. And in fact, air is a fluid. OK, so often the uh, objects um, uh, the, the resisting force in, in high speed motion through air, the resisting force is uh, proportional to often the square of the velocity. It's called a drag force. And so the magnitude of the drag force is, and again, they're talking about the magnitude, not the vector, is the uh, F sub D is equal to D times V squared. So it is important to realize this is proportional to of v squared, but the drag d, that coefficient, depends on the shape and the size of the object and the density. And in this case, we're talking about going through the air. Uh, so that would be the density of air. Now, when an object falls vertically through air, the drag force opposes the body's motion uh, as it increases. And you see the guy is uh, the skydiver, perhaps, is, uh, is going downward, but the downward acceleration uh, decreases because of this force that's going the other way. So eventually, at least if you're jumping from high enough and your shape and the air is dense enough, an object reaches what's called a terminal velocity. Then at that point, its acceleration approaches zero and the velocity becomes nearly constant. So this um, is asking us to derive an expression for the terminal velocity in terms of d and the weight mg of an object. Let's talk about that, and then we'll use this equation. So here we have the object. As long as the resisting force is less than the force down, remember the force down is m times g, 
So as long as this magnitude is less than mg, it will continue to accelerate. But then eventually, as it goes faster and faster through the acceleration, you may reach a point where v squared is the terminal velocity. And at that point in time, dv squared equals mg. That means that the downward force is equal to the upward force. That means there's no more acceleration. That means we continue falling, but at a constant velocity. So what we're going to do is then we're going to look at Newton's second law. So the net force, mass times acceleration, is equal to the downward uh, force minus the resisting force uh, in the again in the y direction, uh, which we're assuming the drag force is d v sub y squared. So these two things are equal. But we said if you reach terminal velocity, your acceleration is zero. So I'm going to put zero here for this, and I have this to solve. And then I can solve this for v sub t. So I'm going to um, subtract mg from both sides, and then I'm going to multiply both sides by a minus sign, and then I'm going to divide by d. Then I'm going to take the score root. So we find by solving this, make sure you follow this logic, but the terminal velocity is mg divided by d. So now we have a formula for that, and now we're going to use that to solve a problem. So uh, for its, uh, skydiver, the value of d, and we said they're in a spread eagle position like the skydivers often are, is going to be 0 0.25 uh, kilograms per meter. And it does ask, does this have the correct units? And in fact, one question I could have asked you is what units does d have to have? So we're going to substitute values in. So the terminal velocity is going to be, we had an 80 kilogram person. The acceleration due to gravity is uh, 9.8. And I told you what the value of D is. So I plug in all those numbers and take the square root. And I get 56 meters per second. And so uh, 56 meters per second is about 125 miles per hour. So you can go quite fast uh, as a terminal velocity when you're falling but it does reach, in this case, a terminal velocity. Uh, here's a problem I'd like for you to consider. As we just saw, objects fall through the air at high speeds. They're actually run by a drag force that's proportional in magnitude to v squared. A falling object speeds up until the magnitude of the force from the air drag equals the magnitude of the object's weight. If a 120-pound woman using a parachute falls with a terminal velocity v a 240 pound man using an identical chute and technique will fall to the earth with which of these terminal velocities you know what to do let's see how you did since both people use the same chute the drag constant d is the same for both but the mass of the man is twice the mass of the woman. So he requires twice the drag force to produce zero acceleration. Now you're taking, since the drag force is proportional to V squared, hence it doubles if the velocity increases by a factor of the square root of two. The answer is B. In closing, now more than ever, time is precious. Each day must count. Do the math. It will make you strong. And now, more than ever, take care of yourself and of each other. We're all in this together. May God bless you all.